to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ finally brethren pray for us that the word of the lord may run swiftly and be glorified. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians. This book is going to deal with several problems related to uh, the second coming of Christ and address those in a very clear and specific way. And friend, it's that second coming that ought to excite us, that ought to encourage us, and that ought to challenge us every day to live for Christ to the best of our ability. And so we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study of 2 Thessalonians. Friend, we're so happy that you joined us for this study of the Word of God. And if you haven't already, please get your Bible and let's have it ready so we can look for ourselves in the Scripture and see that what we're being told is true to the Scriptures, Acts 17, verse 11. This lesson is being brought to you by congregations and individual Christians among the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether it be on Sunday or Wednesday, they'd be happy to have you. Check out the times at your local congregation and stop by and visit them. There are people there who love God, who love the truth, and who more than anything, want men and women to go to heaven. And friend, we want you to know with the gospel of Christ, that's our main focus. We want to do what we can to help people make it to heaven. Our studies today and every time are designed to point men and women toward Jesus and His plan of salvation. If you'd like to have a further study of today's lesson, all our lessons are available online from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have studies on nearly every topic you can imagine and every book of the Bible, and they're all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a hard copy of those, you can download them from our website, or we could send you a DVD and a CD. Just fill out our media request form on our website. We'll send that to you free of charge. And friend, if you need a hard copy, you can also write to us or call us, and we'd be glad to make that available to you. Also, don't forget, in the day of smartphones, you can check out our app, both for Android and Apple, from the respective Play Stores, and that's a great way to study the Word of God in our busy lives as well. Let's now turn our attention to what is the main message in the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and that is the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All five chapters in 1 Thessalonians will close with some statement about Christ's coming. And the book of 2 Thessalonians is replete with addressing certain errors or perversions that are dealt with, uh, that were necessary in the day Paul is talking about in the first century, and some of those who filled over to us today. So let's talk about some of those perversions that relate to uh, Christ's second coming. First perversion is this. Perversion number one is, on that day when Christ comes, everybody's going to be saved and it will be the happiest day ever. Now friend, please don't misunderstand. Does God want all men to be saved? Sure He does. First Timothy 2 verse 4. Does God want anybody to be lost? Nope. He wants all men to be saved. He, won't, he doesn't want anybody to perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. But friend, it is a perversion of the truth that when Christ comes, everybody's going to be saved and it's going to be just a glorious and happy day for everybody. It's not true. For some people, it's going to be a real, real sad day because they weren't prepared. How do we know that? Let's look in our Bible together in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 10. The Bible says this, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give your troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, listen now, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished 
with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Now there's no doubt for some it is a day of great vindication. But for others, and two classes specifically are mentioned, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel, the Bible clearly says these will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Those who don't know God, that is those who've never obeyed the gospel, and those who do not obey, and that's a continual word, continually obey the gospel, live for Christ every day, friend, what a sad day it'll be. And so while God wants everybody to be saved, while we want everyone to be saved, while God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, the sad fact is some people didn't take the opportunity and use it. Just like in Matthew 25, where we've got the bridegroom and the feast that is scheduled there and the ten virgins, Five virgins were ready. Hey, they took opportunity. They knew it was coming. They took their opportunity. They utilized their time correctly. They'd already went and bought oil. Their lamps were already trimmed. And when the bridegroom came, they could light their lamp and go in with him. What about the other five? They weren't ready. And so while the bridegroom was coming, they went into the city to buy oil and to trim their lamp and to get ready right at the last minute. And the Bible says the door was shut and there was no entrance for them. Friend, it'll be sad for people who don't take the opportunity to get ready or people who don't continue faithfully to live 28. for the gospel every day. And so it is a perversion to say everybody's going to be saved and nobody will be lost. You know, we sing a song, there's a great day coming, and it is a great day. But do you remember what one of those verses says? There's a sad day coming. Why? Because some people didn't get ready. Now's the time. Now's the opportunity. Friend, God, God has promised to mete out His vengeance on that day. And hear these words again. On that day, the Lord is coming in flaming fire to punish those who do not know God and do not obey His gospel. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29, and Hebrews 10, 31. And thus Paul would say, uh, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 7 through 11. And so as we've suggested in every one of these lessons, now's the time to get ready. And so we encourage you to get ready and live right for Almighty God each and every day. All right, let's then talk about a second perversion as it relates to the second coming of Christ, and that is dealing with the man of sin. Uh, before Christ comes, the man of sin is going to be revealed, and he's going to be dealt with, and there's a lot of people who have a lot of ideas about what this man of sin is, but what does the Bible say about it? Let's think about this from Scripture. I want you to look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing that he is God. Paul says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And when the lawless one is revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all powers, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason... God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. And so we've still got a lot of people, it seems like, in 2 Thessalonians and who are kind of buying in again to this immediacy. The Lord's coming back any second now. He could be, but they're just really have bought into. It's immediate. 
And so Paul says, let me tell you something else has got to happen before that happens. The man of sin has to be revealed. The man of sin is the ultimate result, Paul says, of the falling away from the faith. Some were departing from the faith in the first century. This evil force from a first century vantage point, according to verse 3, was yet to be revealed. That is, it's in the process of. He's, uh, it's going to be revealed. His persecuting power was designated as the man of sin because whatever this is, sin was its predominating quality. That is, sin was the motivation. Sin was the driving force. And as we well know from verse 4, the man of sin opposes God and exalts himself against all that is holy and sacred. And thus, in some sense, the man of sin, as it were, is going to sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself as God. Now, what else do we know about this? Well, he's very deceptive. He deceives those who love not the truth. By virtue of lying signs or lying wonders, he affects. He claims he can do certain things that are powerful and maybe even miraculous as some might look at them, but it's just a deception. It's not true. And of course, the early stages of this apostasy, verse 7 says, were already at work in the early church. In Paul's days, there was some influence that was restraining or holding this back and that force would eventually be taken out of the way or be gone. And thus the man of sin would have roots in ancient Christianity, nevertheless would endure in some form or another uh, as it relates to Christ's coming and then would be identified. And so when we think about this perversion, this man of sin, this great apostasy, we know that there was apostasy at work in the first century. According to 1 Timothy chapter 4, Verses 1 through 6, some were already buying into it. Some were forbidding marriage and commanding to eat meats, uh, which God had said were fine to eat. Uh, and so some of this apostasy started in the first century. Some people, it was said, couldn't marry, couldn't eat certain things. You've got that apostasy continuing with people like Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence and is forbidding people to do certain things and, and disrupting the work that John is trying to do. And so many people would say that the seeds of this apostasy clearly seen in the first century was Catholicism and the papacy. And that is with the forbidding to marry, the commanding to eat certain meats, one person, one individual trying to gain control over the Lord's church, that that was something that would take place. And of course, no doubt, we see how the Pope kind of sets himself up as God. He's the vicar of Christ. We see that they claim to do great powers and you've got these saints who have done certain miracles and all that's being exalted. And, and how's that tied into the second coming of Christ? Well, Paul is trying to say this, that before Christ comes back, this is going to happen first. And God's going to deal with that. And the Word of God, of course, will be that which comes from the mouth of the Lord to deal with it as well. And thus the man of sin is mentioned not being something that they needed to necessarily lose their focus on and stay true as it related to the second coming of Christ. All right then, let's deal with a third perversion that occurs in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and it's this. Some were saying, Christ's coming is so immediate that you can just kind of quit everything and start looking up in the sky. Well, is that true? Christ is coming back, just quit everything and just stand around and wait for Him? Well, some had evidently bought into that, and Paul has to address it. Let's look at three passages in which he deals with that. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse number 6. What does the Bible say about this? Paul says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the, to the tradition which he received from us. Look at verse 7 and 8. For you know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you. What do you mean disorderly? Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Friend, when we think about 
problems that were arising related to the second coming of Christ. Some were just so sure it was happening any moment they gave up on living. They gave up on life. They quit their jobs. And Paul will say, don't live a disorderly life. To those who are walking and living disorderly among you, we command that you withdraw from them. Now, friend, there's a lot said in the Bible about withdrawal of fellowship, disfellowship, and oftentimes we associate that with some type of heinous sexual sin. Like in 1 Corinthians 5. When we think of disfellowship, we think of the man in 1 Corinthians 5. Here's a man who had his father's wife. Uh, many believe that to be his stepmother, and so he had married his stepmother, whatever the case. He, he married his father's wife, whether it be his own mother or stepmother. He married his father's wife, and he was living in gross immorality, and they were trying to, they were coming to church and acting like everything was okay. And of course, we can kind of understand that. We can say, yeah, that guy, we probably need to disfellowship people like that. What are people being withdrawn from? Four in 2 Thessalonians 3. Laziness. Friend, would we ever consider withdrawing fellowship from someone because they were lazy, not take care of their own family, not working like they ought to? And so disfellowship is a, definitely a biblical idea. Romans 16, 17 tells us we're, not, we're to name those who are false teachers and have nothing to do with them. So if someone's teaching something that's not right, we ought not to be around people like that. If someone is living in gross immorality, we ought to withdraw from that. If someone won't work and not take care of his own family, and you know, even if it's coming out of a religious motivation, that's not what God wants. Now, the second passage that deals with this is found in 2 Thessalonians 3. And I want you to look at verse number 11. As Paul continues this idea, he says, uh, back up to verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness, quietness and eat their own bread. And so Paul says, you know, it's been reported that some aren't even working and providing for their own family. And Paul said, if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. And so one of the things that we find in the Scripture is that when someone takes a family, he's responsible for that family. He's got to provide physically, spiritually for them. And if anyone won't work, you know, I understand when someone's on hard times. Don't, please don't misunderstand what we're saying. Somebody falls on hard times, has things happen to them that are difficult, has a handicap or a disability, uh, is trying to pick themselves up by their bootstraps, but is struggling. Hey, we're all for helping people like that. But if someone's lazy and just won't work, that person deserves to suffer the consequences of that. What do we mean? If a man won't work, neither shall he eat. Sometimes a little growling in your belly might put a person back to work when they need to be. And so we're not trying to say that we want to be unkind or unfriendly to people, but for people who are lazy and are able to work and take care of themselves, friend, that's disorderly conduct. And the Bible says we're not to fellowship, we're not to be around people like that, and we're not to have anything to do with them. We ought to live a good, wholesome life instead. All right, the third passage that deals with this perversion, that Christ is coming back and you can just quit everything, is found in 2 Thessalonians 3. I want you to look in verses 14 through 15. The writer says this, Paul says, And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. How serious is it that we obey God's commands, God's commands about working in the second coming? If anyone, Paul says, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, I want you to note them. That is, mark them out, make a mental note in your mind, this person is not following what the Bible's teaching, and don't have anything to do with them. Don't be around people like that. We are to withdraw from them. We're not to fellowship them. We're to make sure that we don't let that influence us. Now, does that mean that I hate them? 
Of course not. Does that mean that I want to be unkind to them? No. Does that mean that I want to badmouth them or run them down? No, that's not, that's not the idea. Why is it that we don't keep company with them? Friend, what happens if you get a little sin in the church? Well, let's make another illustration of that. What happens if you drop a little bit of yeast in something you're trying to prepare? It begins to activate, right? What happens uh, if you get one bad apple in the bottom of a bushel of apples, that begins to spread. God didn't want that sin spreading through the church. And so when we withdraw from somebody, it's not because we don't love them, but it's because we love God and righteousness and the church so much that we don't want anybody else to be lost. Well, how do I relate to that person? What should be my relationship with them? Do I count them as an enemy? That person isn't doing right. They're not living faithful to the Lord. They're not holding to the truth. They're in sin. Therefore, they're my enemy. No. Don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. What's that mean? I don't hate them. In fact, I can reciprocate what they're going through probably because I've been in sin and I know how devastating and how entrapping that is. And so I don't hate them. I'm not going to make an ugly face at them. I'm not going to turn my back to them and shun them. That's not the idea. Instead, I want to admonish them as a brother. What's that mean? If, I, if I'm in the store and I see somebody who's been withdrawn from and, and I'm starting to head down the aisle and I see them up at the end of the aisle, am I going to go the next aisle? No. I'm going to go down that aisle and I'm going to be kind. I'm going to smile. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to talk to them. And I'm going to take an opportunity to admonish or encourage them. Meaning, I'm going to say, you know, we love you. And we always have. And we want you to know that, you, you know, you've got a lot of talent for the Lord. We hate that things that happen, happen. And we want to do anything we can to help you in your life. We want to encourage them. We want to uh, be a good source of comfort in the sense that we can help them to do right. And we want to say, anything we can do to help you uh, get back with the Lord, anything we can do to help you in your life, is there anything you need? Is there anything we can... We want to treat them just like we would a brother. If your brother physically had some kind of problem, what would you do? Well, you, you'd help him, right? You might not condone the problem, but you'd sure go out of your way to help him. My well, friend, we can, we can help and encourage and admonish and uplift without condoning the sin, right? How do we do that? Well, there's still that lack of fellowship. We can't hold hands with them and sing kumbaya and act like everything's okay when it's not. But can't we try to nudge and urge and help them in the right way with our words and our actions? And so, yes, there is a sense in which sin is very serious, and we don't want that getting in the church, and we've got to withdraw from those kind of actions when someone maintains they're going to live that way and not do what the Bible says. But even then, I ought to go the extra mile to help them. Now, let me illustrate this in a beautiful way. A lot of times when we talk about disfellowship, we talk about the idea of withdrawing from somebody. That makes people so nervous, and, and, and rightly so. People get uptight about that. But, you know, it works, and we see that in the Bible. Let me talk to you about that man in 1 Corinthians 5 again. He was in a heinous sexual sin. He had his father's wife, and the church did what was right, and they withdrew from him. And you know it worked. Let me read you the rest of the story. 2 Corinthians gives us an update on that very situation, talking about that same man. In 2 Corinthians 5 it says, But if anyone's caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be severe. Now watch this, talking about the man that they withdrew from. The punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, that on the contrary you ought to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Watch what Paul says now. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. What happened with that man who got caught up in sin? They withdrew from him, and as a result, he turned his life around. He came back to God, and Paul now says, enough's enough. You don't have to keep withdrawing from him. He made it right. You need to go back up and reaffirm your love to him. And so 
as we think about the book of 2 Thessalonians in particular, yeah, there's a lot of error out there about Christ's coming. But the truth of the matter is, one day, and I don't know when it is, nobody does, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, no one knows the day or the hour, but I know one day the Lord is going to come. And when He comes, that'll be a great day of vindication for His saints. Those who have gone on before us, they'll be caught up together with the Lord in the air. And those who are alive will also be caught up with them in the clouds. And listen to these words, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It's comforting and encouraging to know that one day we can live with the Lord forever. And so we want to do what the books of First, Thess First and Second Thessalonians teach us, and it's this. Since we don't know when, let's be ready always. Friend, what's the greatest thing we could drive home for each and every one of us today about the second coming? It's this. Let's live our lives in such a way that no matter when He comes, we're always ready. Mark 13, 35, Jesus said, What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, be ready. Are you ready? Will the Lord come back soon? Are you ready if the Lord will come back now? That's the way we've always got to live. If you're not a child of God, why not become one? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin to Him, Acts 3, 19? Would you make the good confession, Acts 8, verse 36 and 37? And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and then live every day for the Lord Jesus Christ? Friend, our hope and prayer today is that you are a Christian and that you're living in view of the Lord's coming every day. If that's what you're doing, then friend, the encouragement is don't ever give up. Don't ever get sidetracked. Maintain faithfulness to the Lord. And then when that day comes, won't it be wonderful to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of the Lord. We're glad you joined us today, and may God help each of us to live in view of His second coming. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.